Good afternoon. I'm Jay Fidel. Here we are at Think Tech Talks. We're talking about community matters. Why? Because community does matter. That's why. Okay, today's show is, is entitled, I Have Returned. <laughs> <laughs> and the reference to is to General Douglas MacArthur, who said, I will return. Well, now he has returned in the form of Brad Wong, MD, who just returned on a mission with Aloha Medical Mission to the Philippines. Hi, Brad. Hi, Jay. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for being back. We are, we are happy to see you here, see, see you back, and we want to know exactly what happened. So I guess the, you know, the introductory point is Aloha Medical Mission makes, what, twice or three times a year you go on these missions? Five times a year. Five times a year, sorry. Uh, does such good work, in addition to a dental clinic here in Honolulu. Uh, and uh, it does uh, surgery. A number of surgeons go with staff and equipment, and they go to various places deep, deep in Asia, um, and uh, and try to help people with uh, with surgery, which is a really wonderful thing. In Yiddish, it is referred to as a mitzvah. This is a multiple mitzvah, a continuing multiple mitzvah. That's C M M. <laughs> so, tell us about your trip to the Philippines, this most recent trip of Aloha Medical Mission. Well, I, I took about 55, 60 volunteers. That's big. Uh, we split up to two missions, one week and then followed it with another mission. And actually, this series of missions was the fourth and fifth mission to the Philippines. Uh, my other mission leaders had taken three other missions to the Philippines in the month before me. Uh, Carl Lum to Laguna, Andy Oishi to Palawan, and Alex Vergara to Tugegaral in northern Luzon. And they had already come home by the time our group had left. The Loha Medical Mission really started doing missions to the Philippines. In the Philippines right? in 1983 as an arm of the Philippine Medical Association. Great. Okay, so now you have three separate tracks going on at the same yeah, time. So, and now we've branched out into going to uh, Burma, Nepal. Uh, we help operate a clinic in Bangladesh. Uh, we used to take uh, missions to Laos as well. And right now there is a team uh, preparing to go to Ecuador uh, this coming August. Wow, yeah. you, know, you are expanding. That's yeah, wonderful expanding. what you're and, doing. Uh, a team returned in January, uh, December, from Honduras. Continuing expanding multiple yeah. missions. So we have a group in Los Angeles who's taking uh, mission teams now to Central America and South America. So That's fabulous. Yeah. I didn't I have to watch every minute to yeah. see Stay everything tuned. that's going on. Okay. Stay tuned. <laughs> well, I, you know, it's really remarkable. Uh, how long have we been talking about this and getting you on the show must be four or five, five years. years. Now, yeah. Yeah. So this yeah. mission that I came from, <clears throat> we've been to this town nine times. The town of Bacolod, it's in southern Philippines in an area called Visaya. It's close to the area that was damaged by Hurricane Yolanda. But this area, which is just a hundred miles off the track of Yolanda, was pretty much untouched. Uh, still we take these missions there to do elective surgery on poor people who as you know, and the public should know, wouldn't otherwise be able to afford these surgeries. So we provide a service to a group of people that would never otherwise see a doctor, much less have an operation. It must be so interesting for the community involved, where they live, you know, to have you come in, sort of like a cargo cult thing, just yeah. drop in from the sky and do amazing things and improve the quality of their lives by, by many degrees. And it must be an extraordinary experience for you and the 50 people, 55 people. Well, I, what's interesting is that I have the new people and the students that we bring along write me a report after every mission that's required. And I've gotten four or five reports from the students <clears throat> and some of the new members. And uh, it's very enlightening and heartening to me to hear the words because they don't um, temper their language. A lot of it is this has been inspiring, enlightening, and clearly they realize that we're helping these people in the country. But the, the other side of the story is that they themselves have grown so much and have gotten so much out of the experience of helping others. And I think that's what's so invigorating is that it's a two-way street. The helpers are being helped as well. It's a three-way street. May I offer the thought? Maybe a four-way street. 
the sense that, okay, the helpers help those who need to be helped. And that's a two-way street because they, they exchange, what do you want to call it, they exchange aloha, yeah. the, you know, the juice of life. And then you're there, and you see this happening. So that's a three-way street. It invigorates you. Yeah, definitely. And then you come here and other media in Honolulu, and you tell people what happens. And that invigorates or should invigorate them. So it becomes, you know, true to its name here today, a community matter. <laughs> Our community. Yeah. Well, many volunteers have stated that this is taking a, a service, a product, a a community service to a worldwide community, and it's really an extension of our local community, yeah. really no different. And our local ethic, you know, our local caring, which is really a statement of, you know, people say, oh, I don't know what happened to the Aloha spirit, it's all gone now, everything is hard like nails, people don't care about each other, they're all into their own you know, self-interested silos, S-I-S, self-interested silo. I'm into acronyms, yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then all of a sudden you guys go out there and you visit more places all the time you make greater effort all the time you take with you more people all the time and you you know you demonstrate uh, if there's no other place where it could be demonstrated you demonstrate that the Aloha spirit is alive and well everywhere we go and you are we that's who you are <laughs> well here's a picture of our group and this, we're going to show that picture right now yeah so this is actually about 35 people going to one of the towns. This town was Cabancalan on the island of uh, Negros Occidental. Mm -hmm. and Where is that relative to, say, Manila? Uh, it's probably 500 miles south of Manila. Uh, this group has 10 doctors, another 10 nurses, and another 10 or so, 15 totally non-medical people. Students, their parents, uh, friends, spouses who help out on the mission. Uh, so it's a diverse group of people. They all pay their own way. Uh, they take uh, no reimbursements from anyone in the Philippines and the patients all get operated on for free. Why do they do this? I, well, you know why. It's because I it's I want a, them to know why. <laughs> well, you guys out there know why. It's because you folks do the same thing in various ways as well. When you help big brothers, big sisters, and you contribute to your church or your school, it's the same concept. So we go abroad and do this. And uh, you see some people here on the left, they're actually local sponsors, and they spend a huge amount of time preparing for us. It's not just us here in Honolulu, it's the local people who are wealthy enough to be able to have the free time and to contribute to our mission in no small amount, monetarily and time-wise. And they're just as much a volunteer and giving in ways that we do there in the Philippines. So it's a, a shared Well, it must be interesting. You just roll up your sleeve and you say, Dr. Juan, I'm here to help you, and I don't know how. You have to tell me how. You have to show me how. I haven't been in a, uh, you know, a, a surgical operatory before. Um, tell me what to do, where do I start? That must be an interesting moment because they don't know and you have well, to figure it out and help them know. Well, not only that, but the doctors and nurses are not always the ones that have worked with each other before. And a third to half the group are totally new. They've never been on a mission. But the most amazing thing is within 24 hours, we've opened up our boxes, set it up in the operating room, and the next day we're doing surgery. And this group of people who are in many ways strangers some veterans get together, and we, we can turn your studio into a full-fledged operating room in six hours. I'm available, you yeah. can. <laughs> and uh, within 24 hours, we're operating on people with a group of people that may not have known each other until 24 hours before. How do you bring them together? Well, a lot of it is preparation. You know, people are calling, and uh, we, I am sure that I vet the doctors and nurses that come with me to be sure that they're qualified. <clears throat> and we put them together and they practice their skills and it always works out. It's quite an amazing, it never ceases to amaze me that we accomplish this. Well, you know, we, have, we, we spend a, you know, 50 minutes at the table here and um, every show I remember and the people who are here remember too, it's, a, it's one of those experiences in life where you 
don't forget it somehow you know sticks in your mind i can imagine what it's like it's chaos this what yeah, you do I mean, chaos, it may be chaos <laughs> but you never ever forget yeah. you, this is a life experience that changes you yeah. that you remember until the day you die no i'm getting forgetful now so each one is a new mission yeah to me. yeah now this picture here that you'll see is a typical ward in the philippines this is actually a very clean ward it's a, it's a old hospital but it's a ward that is particularly nice because it's got windows on each side other hospitals we've been to are very dingy and dark but i really love this one because it's clean uh, and you'll see that there are three beds along one wall there's three beds on another wall and two beds down the middle i think our population would not tolerate this the lack of privacy there's one bathroom which is behind that med student there steph sueda mm -hmm. on the right that everyone, including the family, uses. It's a male-female bathroom. The kids, the adults use that bathroom in plain sight of everyone. There's no privacy. And How about yet, the hygiene? It's clean. Yeah, there's sinks. It's, and people, it's got you have volunteers from the community to keep it clean? Uh, the families keep it clean. And that's what is really remarkable. I'm, I'm always impressed at how wonderful the people in the Philippines are. They are happy, they are friendly, they're grateful, they're smiling, and they get along with each other. These are strangers in this ward, but they're helping each other out. They're helping families that they've never seen before, who've been operated on. Uh, the sense of camaraderie is really amazing. That's it never, interesting. It never ceases. Right. This might happen in the U.S. if we had the chance to have surgery in wards like this. But right, get back to basics. <clears throat> it'll never happen. And I, th and I think it's quite, I've been to other places, I think it's quite unique in the Philippines, this sense of, uh, of community and working together. And they do it with a smile. It's really, it's wonderful to see how we're greeted in the morning, how they, working, how they work with each other, strangers in a ward. And it happens at every hospital. It's a wonderful thing. To now, what's see. interesting is that you know we're, we've talked, you and me, we've talked about I guess primarily Nepal, two locations in Nepal and now in the Philippines. You're also in other countries, but each country has its own its own culture about dealing with this. So what you're describing about the way the Filipinos work together and um, you know the experience they create for you is entirely different, for example, yes. than the experience that you might have or see them have in Nepal. Well, it's not that in Nepal they're, they are not friendly, but their cult, the, the Nepalese culture is different in the way that they interface with you. Uh, in the Philippine culture, perhaps it's because we have so many Filipinos in Hawaii and they contributed to our culture, mm -hmm. to the openness of what we have grown up with and are used to, that it's so much closer to what the aloha we have here in Hawaii that I'm used to it. Nepal is a rugged country. The, the need to survive in Nepal is so much harsher than it is in the Philippines. And you can die easily if you don't pay attention in Nepal because of the climate and the roads and, uh, and the geography. So they're on a different level of interpreting personal interreactions. Uh, and so I think they're guarded. I want you to know them and enter their house and their, and their family, they're wonderful people, but the initial reaction is culturally determined, I think, by their geography and the way they have to survive in a different way than in the Philippines, which is tropical and less stressful and creates a different kind of mindset. So the people on the trip, some of them, I'm guessing, had already been to Nepal. Some of them have. And yes. could make this comparison and they saw that this, you're making. They saw this immediately, yeah. too. And so, uh, you know, whatever spiritual value, I use that word loosely, but I think it applies, um, you can get in either place. They could, they could have the benefit of making the comparison, and they could learn so much yeah. more by going ultimately to both places. Yeah. It's a different experience. Yeah. And a, a different positive experience in each place. Yeah. Great for them. Mm -hmm. Okay, go on. Now this picture <coughs> is a view of the operating room in one of the in the poorer town, Kabankalan. And you see here 
that we have two tables in this one operating room. It was designed for one table, but we're in need of space, so we're having two surgeries in one operating room. And you can see it's a nice clean floor. They've got oxygen uh, tanks and a suction machine. Uh, this hospital had two rooms that we use, but they only had one anesthesia machine. So in order to use all of the tables, we actually brought anesthesia machines from the other town and trucked them in uh, to be used here. It's a problem solving thing. You didn't know that going in and you had to make it. Oh, no, we, we knew this before. You yeah. So you, you were prepared to go to the other town yeah. and get it. And we brought our own equipment. Uh, for example, we brought our monitoring equipment for the anesthesiologist. We brought our the cautery machines, which use electricity to stop the bleeding. So we were prepared knowing that they didn't have uh, enough on their side. This is what you were talking about before about the box. You opened the box and That's right. all the stuff was inside. We supplies and equipment that uh, we need to. Uh, Shona, this is an interesting picture. This is the patients waiting for us to see them each day to be operated on the next day. They've waited three or four hours probably for us to even start seeing them. We see them around noontime and they've been waiting from 8 o'clock, 7 o'clock in the morning uh, to be screened. Some of them are mothers with their kids, some of them are women with big uteruses and old men with big hernias. And they'll sit in these chairs talking story and laughing with each other, strangers again, as we come by. And as we walk by, I've made it a habit now, I used to be a very shy person, and I'd come by and say, hello, everybody. And it's so interesting that everyone will say, hello, doc. <laughs> and we'll walk into this room that's behind this wall, and we'll start seeing these patients and signing them up for surgery with one screen between us and the crowd, with patients and nurses and people walking around, people being examined, again, without any privacy. And they're willing to do this, obviously, because they're desiring the surgery. Mm -hmm. But they have this wonderful attitude of being immediately connected to the doctors and nurses and the people there. That's a cultural point, it's for a, sure. It's a fascinating cultural, and but which I am becoming much more appreciative of recently as I see more of this. You know, it's, it's a wonderful view that I think I'm only understanding better now as I get older. That's one of the reasons you're in this, isn't it? Yeah, I think so. To learn about it. So uh, that, that picture you showed a minute ago, that's, a, that's an art picture. It's beautiful. And so I'm wondering, was that your picture, Brad? Of course, Jay. Okay, it'll be clear. <laughs> and then look at the color on that. It's, yeah. it's a knockout photograph. This now, is a New York Times quality <laughs> photograph right here. Yeah, well, it's a recent <laughs> Canon uh, camera. Now, Here's one of our docs. She was, she's from Thailand. His, and this is the interesting story of our volunteers. This is the other thread that I think we haven't talked about in the past, but you, your viewers might want to hear about. The, the type of volunteer that come with us is fascinating. This gal is from Thailand. She was raised in the US. She did her residency in surgery at the UH, University of Hawaii, where I met her. She left and is now working with the U, uh, U.S. Health Service in Mexico taking care of the Native Indians, American Indians, and she's latched on to our missions. And she's sitting next to a girl that we fixed her hernia on, and you can see in the background the bed stretched out in the distance. This ward has 15 beds with no curtains. This is where we visit the patients every morning. And you can see the mom lying with the daughter. They'll sleep here overnight in this huge ward. The mom, too. Yeah, the mom and everyone else. That's marvelous. Yeah. And this gal, who's, Talk about who's a general surgeon <laughs> like myself, is, as she said herself, addicted to the concept of this. She's, she'll be coming with me every year. Oh, good. I want to show you another. Um, picture of the wards which another beautiful photograph yeah. beautiful now could we tolerate this if you or I were operated on and had our gallbladder taken out would we feel comfortable 
recovering in a ward like this after surgery? You would be worried about things. You know, would you be worried about cleanliness, mm -hmm. uh, going to the bathroom? How would you eat? Uh, you've got this boy in the front is awaiting that in the later in the morning he will have his cleft lip fixed. Mm -hmm. So he stayed the night here in preparation for the surgery. You can see that they have to bring their own bedding, put it on the floor and sleep. Mm -hmm. Everyone else has brought their bedding for their mattresses in the background. It strikes me you did a lot of surgery on this trip. This was a, a rec record-breaking trip for you. Yeah, and in five days... 300 something? Well, we did a... In one town, we did six tables. We did two tables doing just gynecology on women, two general surgery tables, and two plastics. And we did 116 patients in five days. In the other town, we did about six, uh, 70 patients. And this is major surgery. Now, this is just part of the mission, though, as you know. The other part is this thing here. And look at the look on his face. We've huh? been distributing these artificial hands called the LN4 hand for free now for the past four years on every mission. Same design as, as before? Same design. It hasn't changed in eight years. And we give this to men and women and children who have had their forearms amputated. In the Philippines, a common cause is dynamite fishing, assault with machetes, fiddling with the electrical systems and they get electrocuted, burns, threshing wheat and rice threshing machines. This guy lost both of his hands. He's been without hands for 20 years. This is the first time now. Someone else will have to help him put these on up. If you have only one hand amputated, you get to do that yourself. But his family obviously is going to have to help him get these hands on. But during the day now, he's seeing the concept that he might be able to ride a bike. He might be able to sweep the house, get in the farm, get back to some useful activities because he can hold a tool now, feed himself, comb his hair, brush his teeth. You can see all of that in his face, can't you? What a picture. So we distributed about 30, 25 hands this trip. In Nepal last year we distributed about 20 and we left 250 hands to be given out over the next year. With people that you trained to that, give them out. Yeah. That's right. This is such a blessing. I mean, you talk about leverage. So little effort and such a relatively cheap device. What is it, $50 for the hand? Yeah, well, we get it free. Free? Yeah, it's manufactured. The cost is $50, yeah. yeah. Um, and, they, and they manufacture it and put it together for free because they get subsidies. The real cost is shipping and getting yeah, it distributed. Yeah. And, and, and then you, you change someone's life. You, you, do. you re reclaim that person's yeah. life. What a gift. And we bring dentists along too. There's a huge need for dentists in Nepal. In Nepal, I'm sorry, in the Philippines. The Philippines has one of the highest rates of tooth decay in the world because people are wealthy enough to buy soft drinks. There's so much availability of these sweetened candies and drinks that the kids have access to. The teeth are damaged at an early age, and there's a huge need for dentists, uh, particularly in the Philippines. Mm -hmm. Now, this picture was one of the most dramatic patients that we've taken care of recently. Here's a young man who has a congenital disease called neurofibromatosis, and you can see the deformity that he's living with. His left eye, his right eye is blind because it's been dried out, because his lids cannot close because of the weight of this tissue mm -hmm. dragging on his face. So he's blind in his right eye. And you can see that he's eking out a smile because he knows that we're gonna operate on him. When he first came, he and we were uncertain whether we could do this, but we had a plastic surgeon with us. And let's see what he looks like post-op. Now, this isn't a face that you would say is a handsome face if you passed him on the street. I would venture to say that most people would look at him and, and still would consider his face grotesque. 
but in, um, we put a mirror to him. You know, this is the first day post-op now that he's looking at himself without those tags of skin hanging from his face, and he's ecstatic. In his mind, he's handsome. His life has changed, and his family is elated that even though by our standards he's not a handsome guy, he is now in his mind because his stability is so much improved. Wow. Gifts come in. And he'll look a lot better in a month. I think the swelling will go down. Yeah. <clears throat> he's still blind in his right eye. That'll never yeah. uh, recover. Does this require more surgery? I mean, is well, more surgery... Well, we're, we're thinking about this and maybe next year uh, we'll return to the same place. And it's possible that uh, our next plastic surgeon could improve the appearance even more mm -hmm. after this heals. What a story. Yeah, interesting. Now, I have to confess, though, you know, it's not all hard work and grueling times, because our players really have a lot of fun. and. We've got a nurse here on the right. She's a veteran with me. She's been going with me for seven years. And she has a friend from Canada on your left. She's a high school kid who thought she was interested in medicine. And she came with us on this trip and worked with us for a week. Uh, she thought that she might be a nurse, started working with us in the operating room, and now realizes that she will be a nurse, but she could also be a doctor, and that her horizons opened up. Uh, that's not to say that something is wrong with being a nurse, that's not what I'm trying to imply, but that her sights were set by her thinking that her education would only suit her to become a nurse, that she couldn't get further than that because of her upbringing and what other people told her. But now she realizes that she doesn't have to stop there. She could be a dentist, she could be a nurse, she could become a doctor, she could become more than what she thought she could because she met and hobnob with doctors and nurses who were skilled people who she had never associated with before. And this is that other advantage, this other dimension that these kids experience when they come with us. Something well, about everybody has to put their pants on one leg at a time and they're just human beings, and she could be like them too. That's right. She, now she has some examples that uh, she could uh, use to inspire her. That's wonderful. So you change her life too. Yeah. Everybody's yeah. life is changed in this. Yeah. What about the um, what about the the problems? You know, I mean, every time you come back from one of these trips, we talk about it. There's always something that was a problem of some kind. Well, I didn't get sick, Jay. Okay. Everyone else did. That's, I wasn't asking that specifically, but that's yeah, part of so, it. Huh? And as usual, about a third to 40% of the group got sick. They were throwing up diarrhea, <laughs> coughing, but I was immune this time. <laughs> you had, <you've> had enough <laughs> time. I, to I had my <laughs> epidemic you know, five months ago. So, and it's not fun to operate when you're sick um, because if you an anesthesiologist bows out for a day, we don't have a table. Can't function. We can't work. So no. these guys are operating uh, ill for a day or so. You know, they bounce back, but because of the circumstances, you can't take a day off. Well, but can't, you know, can't you, isn't there some kind of technology or medicine that can uh, stop people from being sick? Like the San Miguel? <laughs> Is that well, beer you mean? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There was some San Miguel going around in okay. an attempt to prevent illness. <laughs> A new use for San Miguel. <laughs> yeah, like I guess doctors get sick like everyone doctors, else. And, you know, we're living in such close quarters. Yeah. We're eating together, staying. We're in this operating room. We're seeing patients. Who in could our face. have some microbes, yeah. <laughs> and many, and we know that a lot of our staff got sick from the patients who were sick. And particularly in the TB in Nepal, there's a high rate of undetected tuberculosis. 
So there is a risk of contracting tuberculosis. And in fact, we did uh, operate on two people who had tuberculosis, and we made that diagnosis from their, from their biopsies. But that's always a risk, too, of developing and contracting TB. That's risky. In these it is. I mean, that's, a not a, that's not yeah. a good risk. And, 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 but people go, go anyway. Yeah. Knowing that risk exists and knowing that TB could be a really bad thing yeah. in your life, they still go. Still go. That's, that's, that's powerful stuff. Yeah. I need a break. Let's take a break. Let me take a break. That's Brad Wong, MD, Aloha Medical Mission, who's been doing this for many years, who's who's done an organized surgery around hundreds, thousands, I'm sure thousands of patients in, uh, in, in all around Asia now. And uh, a wonderful organization, really. I mean, it's the, it's the emblem of Hawaii. It's the finest that Hawaii can offer the world, really, beyond anything else. This is Think Tech Talks. We're talking about community matters. We're talking about lots of communities today. And the title I have assigned is I Have Returned, referring to Brad. We'll be right back after this break. <laughs> Castle and Cook, Hawaii. Investing in Hawaii, creating communities, and providing for the needs of our state. Collateral Analytics, empowering the real estate industry to make better informed property investment decisions. The Foreign Trade Zone, bringing the benefits of the Foreign Trade Zone programs to Hawaii businesses and entrepreneurs. Galen Ho, a senior executive of BAE Systems, a global defense, security, and aerospace company. Hawaiian Electric Company, and its affiliates Maui Electric and Hawaii Electric Light Company on Hawaii Island. The Hawaii Energy Policy Forum, incorporating diverse perspectives to design a flexible and forward-looking energy strategy. Hawaii Energy, the state's energy and efficiency program created to help Hawaii's residents and businesses adopt a clean energy lifestyle. Hawaii Gas, helping Hawaii achieve its transition to clean energy and a better energy future. Hawaii Pacific Health, bringing technology and teamwork together to transform healthcare in Hawaii. The High Tech Development Corporation, attached to DBED, is the state's leading technology agency. The Scheidler Family Foundation, supporting educational, cultural, and charitable organizations, including Think Tech. We're back, we're live, we're here with Brad Wong, MD of Aloha Medical Mission, reviewing his trip that he came back recently from the Philippines, here on Think Tech Talks, talking about community matters, title, I have returned from the Philippines. So, uh, you know, not everybody is the same. Some people can deal with the cultural arbitrage better than others. Um, sometimes it doesn't work out so well as other times. What's the recipe, and what's the recipe for failure? Well, you never know when you bring a new person on how they're going to react in a setting. And every so often we have one, two, three, four people that just can't do it. Uh, it's, and I have been unable to be able to predict who that's going to be. That's interesting. Yeah. You know, it's like hiring people in general, except you can't replace them here in the middle. Uh, <laughs> I mean, you take the recommendation of friends who know these people that um, they're a good this or that, a nurse, a doctor, they get along with people, and you throw them into this mix of what is in fact a high tension environment, because okay. we don't want to have people dying. We don't want to have mistakes. Uh, they're not working in an environment that they're used to. And you take a surgeon, an anesthesiologist, a nurse out of their environment where they've been working for 10, 15 years, they're comfortable, and you throw them into a place that they are totally uncomfortable and unused to things, and they behave differently. And yeah. how they do that, whether they get along or not, is unpredictable. And most get along well, and, and in fact have a great time mixing in with this brew, but many don't do well. That must be one of the great you know, mysteries. <laughs> well, but it's not, oh, gee whiz. Take a break, Ian. I'm Hong Jiang, host for Asia in Review on Tuesdays. And I'm David Day, 
hosts for Asian Review on Thursdays. Both of us broadcast our respective shows at 4 p.m. And my topics tend to deal with uh, questions related to environment, culture, history, and sometimes human rights. And my shows tend to be on international business, foreign policy, geopolitics, and national security. And you can watch our shows live on the ThinkTech website at thinktechhawaii.com. And uh, you can also watch us on YouTube or Olalo. So come join us on Thursdays at 4 p.m. I'm David Day. And on Tuesdays at 4 p.m., I'm Hong Jiang. Aloha. Aloha. I'm Jay Fidel of ThinkTech. We have some news for you. In addition to our ThinkTech TV show and our Asia in Review show on Olelo 54, as of January 1st, we're adding Community Matters to play also two hours a week. Check out thinktechaway.com for the specific times of each of these shows. We hope you enjoy all three. Mahalo, I'm Jay Fidel. You know, what's wonderful about live streaming TV <laughs> is that anything could happen. We have had it all down here. One time we had a leak with the water coming down on the camera. Um, this was so this was mild where the alarm went off. Something you said, Brad. <laughs> it's a mystery. <laughs> Anyway, I wanted to comment on what you were talking about, and that is, it seems to me, this is one of the, the great lessons, the great you know, experiments, a social experiment. It is, absolutely. Of putting disparate personalities who don't know each other in a pot, stirring the pot with this extraordinary environment of tension and challenge, and seeing what happens to the human soup in there. You know? It's a reality <laughs> show. Yeah, it's exactly. a survivor show. A survivor show. <laughs> And each trip has its own pluses and minuses to it. You know? Well, how is this trip different from all the other trips for you? I mean, because you, you can't say they're all the same. No, they're, they're certainly not, they're not, not the same. same. Uh, I, I'd summarize this in, in, in camaraderie, I think. This group, the two groups that came for these two missions, which were only two and a half hours by road, separated from each other, some came for one and left. Some stayed to go to the other mission, and some came to meet us for the second. Uh, I would say that it went smoothly enough that everyone had a great sense of accomplishment and camaraderie in this, that beginners, non-medical, amateurs, felt that they had done something and had learned something. I think that was the overall trend of this mission. There were no major problems, personality problems, no major surgical problems. So in that aspect, uh, we were fine. But I, I think the great positive thing was that everyone had a good time. And what do you mean by good time? good time? They grew from it. They had a positive experience. It wasn't yeah. a happy time like a party. But they had a good time because from the reports that I got already from the kids and some from the newbies, they had a life-changing experience. I think that's the good part. Many, most of the group had a positive experience. So I mean, the question that comes to mind is uh, somebody might watch this and say, gee, that, that is so interesting. This is such a, a growing, um, vital organization with such heart, such spirit. Um, this, this could be a good time for me, too. Um, should I call Brad Wong? Should I contact Brad Wong and ask him if I can go on, on one of these trips? And I wonder what you would say to that person who might be considering this. Uh, what, what are the qualifications? What is the mindset? What works? Uh, who should call you? Well, you know, obviously I can't take 50 lay volunteers on a mission, and I have to be discriminating. And the group, and every mission leader has to do this. There are non-medical people that we depend on. So I, um, I, I can't put a call out there, call me and I'll take you. you know, some people hear about us that are critical people, an, an operating room nurse, a recovery room nurse, a doctor, an anesthesiologist, that I find, thank God they called me because I just needed them. Uh, the non-medical people, oftentimes I have to turn away because I don't have room. We certainly need your monetary contributions to a low medical mission because without that we cannot keep our organization running that keeps 
the missions uh, traveling abroad. Uh, but I certainly can't open it up to the public to, to offer them to come on a mission. When I speak at schools, our other mission leaders have friends of friends. Uh, they go to their community organizations, and that's how they're, they'll acquire the team members. It is based a lot on word of mouth. You know, we want people that are going to be committed, not just a passerby who thinks that they might want to do it. So we need to have some vetting of, of these volunteers. So I'd say it's not a scientific process at the moment. And not everybody qualifies. And not everybody can qualify. And but if you do qualify, it means you're special. And if you do go, it means you'll have an experience you'll never forget. Yeah. Thank you, Brad. Thank you, Jane, for having me on. Wonderful. I hope we can get some video from you and make an OC-16 movie. It's coming up. OK. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back. Thanks. <laughs> That's Brad Wong, Aloha Medical Mission. This is ThinkTech. I'm Jay Fidel. We're talking about community matters because they do. Uh, and we have talked to Brad Wong about I have returned. Indeed, indeed, he has returned from the Philippines only to make other trips again in the near term. Thank you, Brad. Thank you, Jay. <laughs>